Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. In our lives, may this be so. Welcome, everybody. Welcome in friendship, welcome in faith, and welcome in God's all-inclusive and generous love. Well, what kind of week have you had this week? A little calmer, not so much. Well, I know it's been up and down for many people, but I'm glad you're here this morning in our digital spaces. Some of you are watching the service a little later in the week, and that's great too. Some of the benefits of our hybrid ministry. So whoever you are and wherever you're tuning in, we all gather to pursue God's wisdom and to be embraced by God's love. And speaking of embraced and healing love, I'm happy to report that the people who tested positive for COVID in our church are well on their way to recovery. Amen. And as I mentioned last week, one of the individuals didn't even have any symptoms. So we have had no new cases reported here in the church this week. And that's just the way we like it. So with this in mind, next week we are planning on returning to in-person services again. So call ahead or email Susie to reserve your pew or your seat in the pew. And this, of course, is bearing all unforeseen circumstances because we know how things go, don't we? In our announcements this week, have you seen our new church sign on the west side of the church yet? A big shout out to Ian McTavish's high school class for making the sign in the words Trinity United Church and of course, the color fits right in with the color of the rest of the church. And also to Ean's wife, Marnie, Marnie Martin, for the beautiful tapestry that is just below it. There's a write-up on that tapestry on the church uh, window. It's called a repository of memory. And it's actually a reproduction of a hand-woven tapestry. And Marnie says, I think of our memories, individual and collective, as a natural resource that we can use to guide and sustain us. Our memories can act as the water, shaping and transforming us, or as a rock, giving shape and meaning to things around us. Very beautiful and a wonderful addition to our church building. So thank you to everybody who have been involved in making this a reality. Our Faith Matters Circle is meeting on Zoom on Monday evening at seven o'clock. Please let me know if you'd like an invite. The church board met on Zoom this week and we are inviting all our church teams to get their wish lists in it's budget time again. So with budget time just around the corner, you're invited to get your lists in to Santa Will. <laughs> you've been called a lot of things, Will, but I don't know if you've been called Santa Will. The deadline for our newsletter, The Dragonfly, this Wednesday. So please send your submissions to Linda Arnold. We are aiming to have the newsletter out in the community by the end of the month, okay? Because the end of the month, of course, ushers in the season of Advent. And next week, we're celebrating the reign of Christ Sunday. And as I just mentioned, it will be an in-person service, but as always, Alistair is recording the service and it will be uploaded to YouTube early in the week. So you can go to church any day or any night of the week, right? You, um, somebody called it waffles and worship. <laughs> I kind of like that. Wa waffles and worship on Sunday morning. But you can have waffles 
any time during the week. So in our joys and concerns, our hearts, of course, are with Nadia again today. She having lived the first full week without her beloved Kim. There's a lovely write-up on Mitchell's uh, website about Kim and his life, and I really encourage you to have a look at it. What a remarkable man and a remarkable life. So many things I bet you didn't even know about him including the fact that he was a professor at the University of Toronto, and he had his PhD. You would never know, such a gentle, humble spirit. What a great guy. And there's also a great article in the Doppler where Nadia was interviewed about Kim and about COVID and about the necessity of getting our vaccines. So you may also like to read it. And it came to my attention this week that it has been two years ago this week that quite unexpectedly, a long time serving and a much beloved minister here at Trinity United Church, Reverend Derek Shelley passed away. Two years. May our hearts be filled with warm memories as we look back and we remember the good times with Derek, and may Derek's memory inspire us to be fully present and cherish each and every day because we never know when that great clock of life is going to stop ticking. So, Reverend Derek, we remember you today. In our birthday corner, we are sending birthday wishes to Lynn Strickland and Shirley Woodard, who both celebrated their birthdays on Friday. Now, Nancy Waxel and myself, we sang to Shirley out on the steps on Friday when we went over to pick up our soup and sandwiches. Well, let's just say we made a joyful noise because I don't think Kianga would be too impressed. <laughs> So birthday wishes from all of your friends here at Trinity, and let's hope for a healthy and wonderful year ahead. And speaking of Kianga, I think she has something special for our birthday girls. Kianga? <laughs> Happy birthday. Okay, let's take a quiet moment. This is one of my favorite parts of the service, I think. Just take a moment for quiet meditation. Settle in wherever you are, sitting on your couch. Maybe you're on your desk chair, or you're sitting around the kitchen table, or the dining room table. Take a few deep breaths. Inhale the breath of God and exhale all the tension, all the angst and the worry of the week that is passing. Spirit of life, come on to me, come on to us. We place the hours and the events of this day in your hands. Fill our souls with the solace of your spirit. Open our hearts to feel your presence and your love. Doesn't that feel good? We don't do that often enough. We don't take those moments often enough in our busy, hectic weeks. And now, the lighting of our Christ candle. And I'm going to call upon Kianga to come forward for the lighting of our Christ candle this morning, seen as there's only three of us here. <laughs> and as we light our Christ candle this morning, it reminds us that whenever two or more are gathered in my name, I am with you also. May the flame in our candles remind us that the task ahead is never greater 
than the strength within. God has our backs, always. Amen. Join me now in the call to worship, and you will see the words come up on your computer and your TV screens. In the gift of this new day, in the gift of this present moment, in the gift of time and eternity intertwined, let us be grateful and let us be attentive. Come and experience God's wisdom and the God who knows us inside and out. We have come to listen not only with our ears, but with our hearts, our minds, and our whole beings. Let us walk into the week ahead, shaped not by our failures or mistakes, but by God's grace and healing love. Let us celebrate God's presence together. Our opening hymn in our service this morning is from our More Voices hymn book, number 89, and of course the words will be on the screen. It's called Love is the Touch. Kianga. is a spiritual practice of our Christian tradition, so let us gather now and speak to God. Let us pray. Gentle spirit of life, we come to you as your people, all different, all gifted, united in spirit, our one human family. Strengthen our ties of faith and affection that hold us together wherever we may be today. Open our minds to your truth, soothe our hearts with your spirit, and comfort our souls with your presence, today and every day. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now we're going to have our anthem played by our very own Kianga Lee. And I know as soon as she starts to play it, you will know the tune because we used to sing it almost every single Sunday morning as an introit. Do you know what it was? 
Holy, holy, holy. Kianga? Did you just hear that? That was a collective awe from everybody who was listening to that. I mean, I've heard that song before, but I've never heard that song before. <laughs> I think Alistair just said many variations on the theme. Oh, you truly are a gift to all of us and to everybody who has the opportunity to, to hear you play. Thank you. Loving spirit, you speak to us in so many ways. In the notes of music played by our very own music director. In the babbling of a brook, in the first fallen snow, in the voices of our friends and in the stories of the Bible. Speak to us now and help us to hear your voice in your holy word. May your word come alive in the actions of our daily lives. Amen.
The scripture reading this morning is from Mark 12, 38 to 44. Jesus denounces the scribes and the widow's offering. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our light and our true abundance. Amen. Once about a time, there was a conversation taking place in Farmer John's barnyard between a couple of animals. They were concerned about Farmer John He'd been walking around with the weight of the world on his shoulders. The farm hadn't been doing so well, maybe because of COVID, maybe because he couldn't get the workers he needed for the harvest, who knows? But the pig and the chicken wanted to do something to cheer him up. I know, said the chicken, he loves to eat. So let's prepare him a country style breakfast. Hmm. How does bacon and egg sound? Well, the pig pondered the idea for a moment and said, well, the breakfast idea sounds great, but the menu, uh, I'm not too quite sure about. Well, why is that, asked the chicken. Well, the pig responded, that breakfast requires a single donation on your part, but for me, it requires a personal sacrifice. A personal sacrifice. This is exactly one of the things that we are seeing in our scripture text this morning. Our lesson from Mark's gospel is part of our larger section found in three of the four canonical gospels. In both Mark and Luke, we see rich people putting in a lot of money. And then Jesus notices a poor woman, a widow, who puts her two small copper coins in the temple's offering box. Jesus, never to miss a teachable moment, calls the disciples over to him, and this is what he says. This poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury, for they gave out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, gave all she owned, all she had to live on, end of quote. His commentary makes it clear that the widow feels the impact of her contribution so much more than all the rich people giving money that they didn't really need. She gave the only money that she had to survive Traditionally, and maybe you have heard the sermons in the past, this passage has been used to encourage people to give more money, especially more money to the church. But don't turn off your <laughs> don't turn off your TV or your computer. I am not going to ask you for a single solitary cent. We have historically assumed, says biblical scholar Paul Penley in his book called Reenacting the Way of Jesus, 
that Jesus is commending the widow for her actions. For years, even centuries, we have applauded this widow's heart that is tied to her courageous giving and, of course, her generosity. Like that pig on Farmer John's farm, she's all in. This woman does indeed exemplify a generous and open heart. There's no doubt about it. But is there more to this story than first meets the eye? Does Jesus simply want to praise this woman's sacrificial heart and her actions? Well, the only way that we can truly answer this question is to examine the context. Context is so important when we read biblical scripture. We must interpret each story by it, how it connects to the material before and after it. Jesus is not talking about generosity or self-sacrificial love before or after this story of the woman's meager offering. So what is he speaking about? He's talking about the corrupt religious leaders who control the temple and how they walk around claiming the chief seats in the synagogues, all the while devouring the widows' homes, robbing the widows of their homes for their own financial gain. Scholars believe Jesus is not commending the woman for her generosity, but he's lamenting a grave injustice. Penley says Jesus' praise for the widow is raw sarcasm directed at the temple leaders. End of quote. This woman has become a victim of a religious institution which is intended to take care of her. The temple should be helping her, not taking her last two pennies. You see, we typically assume that Jesus says in this scripture, go and do likewise, when we see what the elderly woman is doing. He does this in other scriptures, but he's not doing that here. He emphasizes that the woman, out of her poverty, put in all she owned and all she had to live on. The repetitive all she owns and all she had to live on draws us to something else. It draws us to another message that Jesus is trying to bring his readers, and you and I too as well. This woman no longer has anything left to live on. Why? Because the temple teachers have convinced her to donate it to their extravagant slush fund. Penley says, and I quote, this woman's offering is not an illustration of generosity at all, but an act of injustice, end of quote. Now, I don't think we can completely overlook this woman's generous heart. But I think we need to see how Jesus, in his own authentic way, is equally concerned about the corruption that is happening right beneath his nose. You see, Jesus is a prophetic voice of his time calling for systemic changes designed to create a better and more just world for all people. Not just those who are sitting at the top of the social, religious, and political pyramids. Whether it be the ancient Egyptians with their pyramid system of the pharaoh at the top, down to the slaves at the bottom, or a similar structure in the Roman Empire with Caesar at the top. Gratitude 
turned into something that folks at the lower rung of the ladder owed or were obligated to express to those higher up. You see, common people didn't have a lot of power in ancient Rome. But if they organized, if they had the right leadership, they could topple these pyramids, the pyramid structure of Roman life and rule. And this is ultimately what killed Jesus because he was a threat. He was a threat to their corrupt and cushy way of living. Rome's way of dealing with rebellion was to prevent the rebellions before they started. Their thinking was, keep the people fed and keep the people entertained and they will remain loyal and grateful to Rome. So just picture those great gladiator contests and the chariot races and Caesar throwing the bread to the peons below. And for all of this, people were held in Caesar's debt. Yeah, that's how Caesar saw it anyway. They literally owed Caesar a debt of gratitude, which he happily took from them in high and oppressive taxes. In short, when society is shaped like a pyramid, Gratitude is a debt, it's a duty. Something that is owed to the person at the top of the pyramid, it has very little to do with flowers and thank you cards. And in a pyramid system, there's never enough. As you move down the pyramid, what happens? It gets larger, there's more people. More people, less resources. In our Faith Matters circle this week, we are studying the book Grateful, The Transformative Power of Giving Thanks by Diana Butler Bass. And Butler Bass writes, in Jesus, God takes the pyramid and makes it a circle. And makes it a circle. In a circular structure, as opposed to the top-down pyramid structure where the currency is injustice, we journey together. We sit together at the same table. We focus on other people's strengths and supporting one another. And we share as equals because we recognize that our lives are connected, that we are all one in this life together. In our circle structure, sharing is rooted in love, not in obligation. We give out of love and we receive out of love. Yes, on the surface, we see this woman's courageous giving, but as we peel back the layers, we see so much more. When we look at the context of the story, we see things like manipulation. We see things like corrupt systems. We see things like injustice to vulnerable and poor people. Is there anything else we can glean from the courageous giving of this elderly woman? Well, writer David Luce offers us another way he points out that perhaps the focus of the story is not so much on the religious leaders. Maybe it's not so much about the widow, but on what Jesus does. He sees this widow. In ancient biblical times, women are little more than chattel, insignificant, invisible, and sadly, this is still the case for some cultures in our world today. Among all the people putting money into the temple treasury, Jesus notices this woman. 
Luke writes, and I quote, and whatever it is that Jesus wants his disciples to learn from her, perhaps the first lesson is simply to notice her, to see her, to acknowledge her, her being, her plight, and her offering. Whether we are rich or poor, we can't think of this woman as a project or a statistic. We need to notice her. We must notice those on the street who are struggling to get by, those who have to sit in the alleyways at night to stay close to the warmth of the buildings, often in cardboard boxes and a frayed blanket. We, too, have to open our eyes to see people like this woman who pass through our lives often ignored or forgotten. Do we really see the student who comes up to our food pantry outside our church? Do we really? Do we strike up a conversation with them? Do we learn their name? Do we ask them anything about themselves? About who they are, anything about their life story? Do we share anything about ourselves with them? Do we notice them or do we just walk quickly by and turn our heads, reach into our pocket and get our keys and get in the door as soon as we can? They're not our kind of people. Well, whose people are they? They are God's people. They're our people. Do we stop and say hello to the person that we put our change in that street person's cup? Do we? Do we even say good morning or are they invisible? We can't see Jesus if we can't see that street person or the poor woman today in our text. We can't do anything to change the broken systems that rule us until we see that they are indeed broken. If we want to be followers of Jesus, if we want to grow our hearts and souls, we must first see like Jesus sees. These short verses, six in total, they sure pack a wallop, and they're layered with rich and multiple meanings. Jesus didn't come to put a Band-Aid on our brokenness. Jesus came to heal it. He came to show us all a better way to live, to usher in a whole new system, to reveal God's dream for our world. A dream where generous hearts, just systems, and love for all God's people rule the world. I wonder, I wonder, can this be our dream too? All glory be to God. Amen.
And now this is the time in our service where we invite you to give your offering. It's also a time I'd like to bring your attention to, well, what we were speaking about in my message today. Reaching out to those with the hand of hope. And our outreach committee, uh, we're looking for hats and mitts and socks to help those who are in need in our community. And our White Gift Sunday is coming up. It'll be here upon us before you know it, December the 5th. And again, with your faithful support, we're hoping to ease the stress of Christmas for so many families. And we have found in the past that it is uh, more helpful to give gift certificates. So make sure when you're ordering with Gord, your shopping uh, cards for the coming month to include that in your list. By the way, you can pick up your shopping cards and your gift cards at Gord and Franz too. They're here. So White Gift Sunday, gift certificates, and if you are uh, talented when it comes to knitting needles, hats, mitts, and socks, and if you're not, if you're like me and you can't sew on a button, there's always somewhere where you can go and you can buy a pair of warm socks and a warm pair of gloves. So our offering will now be received and God to all who hunger, give us bread. And for all who have bread, let us hunger for more equality and more justice for all your people. God works through us to bring the bread of hope to others. Join me now in the offering prayer as it appears on your screen today. Divine One, here is the work of our hands and minds, and here is the love of our hearts. Accept these gifts we bring before you now. Bless them and bless us so we may be a hope-filled light in a world that is so often blanketed in darkness. In offering these gifts, we express our commitment to be followers of Jesus and his way, a way of compassion and a way of generosity for all God's people. Amen. And now we will sing hymn number 400, Lord, Listen to Your Children Praying. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving spirit, we thank you for the blessings of this day and of the week that is passing. 
Thank you for the pure and simple gift of life, our single solitary breath, for the wonders of creation, the delights of human companionship, and the assurances of faith. We remember before you the suffering of humanity and the brokenness of our world. We know you have a dream for this world, a dream where everyone has a place at the table of life, a place where we are all treated equally and with respect. Help us, as followers of Jesus, to build this table, a table where we refuse to retaliate, where we are quick to forgive and quick to share whatever power or resources we have with one another. Help us, like Jesus, to see the injustices that are all around us. And like Jesus, work to topple systems in the world that keep people trapped and oppressed. This morning, we especially bring before you Dorothy Wilson, Bill Corrigan, who underwent cataract surgery this week, Nadia, as she continues to walk through the valley of sorrow. Doris and Joe. Rob Atfield and his wife Lynn. May these people feel your loving and healing presence. And to anybody who is listening to my voice at this moment, who is in need of healing and prayer, spirit, be with you also. And now, in the silence of our hearts, we lift up to you our own personal cares and concerns. God, Hear all our prayers, and in your love, answer. And now in the words our spiritual companion taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn in our service today is... We are pilgrims on a journey, and indeed we are, and we'll sing the first four verses only. Kianga.
In the spirit of love we have gathered, and in the spirit of love we shall depart. And now may God bless you and keep you. May God's wisdom guide you. May God smile upon you and be gracious to you. And may God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace and go in love. And in the week ahead, remember, you know the words. Say them with me. Be good to one another. We'll see you back here in person next Sunday. Have a great week. Bye for now.